Hi, Julia. Uh, there, there's an awful lot uh, about. Um, first of all, we've got police considering uh, whether or not they're going to admit that the police forces are institutionally racist. We've also got a woke brigade telling the armed forces to avoid saying phrases like people being blind, drunk or crippled with debt because that would apparently cause offence. Yes, really. And we've also now got um, the Welsh government run, of course, by Labour. As now, uh, to, they're now uh, planning a curriculum, a sex education curriculum, with no <clears throat> reference to the sexes, removing all references to boy, girl and even women. Um, I don't even know where to start, Brendan. <laughs> Everyone's insane, apart from us, is kind of my starting point. But um, let's talk, first of all, about the police. Um, institutionally racist, will the police, even if it's even if it was true, stating it, will that change anything? You know, the, the thing that struck me about that story is that the police think that it will boost their moral authority if they confess to being uh, institutionally racist. But of course, it will have the opposite impact entirely. They will lose trust amongst huge sections of the population. Lots of people, you know, ethnic minority people in particular, will be perfectly justified to think, well, I'm not going to ask that copper for help because he's probably part of this institutionally racist problem. I think it will it will backfire very badly. And I think what it will just amount to from the police is this virtue signal it's a way of saying we've recognized how awful we are we've recognized how terrible terrible we are we're going to confess this in public in order to win some brownie points but it won't help the police restore trust with the population mm. and that's the problem and that, that's the thing isn't it i mean maybe if they sort of just walked down the road and and, and beat themselves with virtue yeah. virtue branches you know, that, that, you know the self-flagellation I and mean, we need to tackle the actual problems and the people who are racist and deal with those people as opposed to just the sort of blanket statements which are effectively you know, I've got very good friends who work in the police service they're not racist I, I you know I I think they would take it great offense at, at being accused of that I mean in terms of the armed forces and this usual stuff we get about phrases that apparently can can uh, can be considered to be racist whether or, or, or offensive you know blackmail things like that or whitewashing but this is saying we should avoid using phrases like blind drunk and crippled with debt uh, to avoid causing offense to the disabled. I mean, <laughs> where do we even start? Where do you start? It's preposterous. You know, I've never really liked the phrase political correctness gone mad, but this really is political correctness gone mad. There's no other way to describe it. And it, it's actually really patronizing to disabled people, if you ask me. They know perfectly well, like the rest of us do, that when someone says blind drunk, they are not offending people who are visually impaired. They're just using a descriptive term. If you say crippled with debt, that is not an insult against people who suffer from disabilities or who have some form of disability. These are just terms that we use. And I think one of the problems with the policing of language today is that it looks for offense where it simply doesn't yeah. exist. And these are not used as abusive terms that the vast majority of people do not take offense at them. And the fact that the army is doing this, I mean, China and other <laughs> emerging super powers must be laughing their heads off as they look at the British Defence Forces having to go through these PC indoctrination programmes and must be thinking what a bunch of wimps we are. So yeah. it's also sending a bad signal to the world, I think. Oh, absolutely. And and then what's interesting is these things you mustn't say. And, and then here are things where, I mean, I am offended by this because I am a woman. I, I, I am not, I'm not just, you know, uh, some sort of strange other creation. I am a woman. Men <clears> and women, boys and girls being removed or reference, being removed from sex education classes the curriculum being taught by uh, by, by teachers in the Welsh um, system um, of course it's the labor run Welsh government that's brought this in it's the relationships and sexuality education code scheduled to be debated in the Welsh Senate for just 30 minutes today before coming into force um, and it's going to remove all references to sex effectively uh, and uh, and replacing it with sexuality so this is effectively saying, again, you are what you identify as opposed to the biology you are born with. This is not what most people think and it's not what the law states. Absolutely. And it's definitely not what should be taught to children. Children need to understand biological reality. That's one of the sciences. It's very, very important. Also, the way children socialise themselves and get to understand the world is through the category of sex, mother and father, boy and girl, man and woman. That's the way they negotiate their surroundings and understand who they are. So 
this purposeful confusion of children with the uh, cult of transgenderism, I find it very, very worrying. And it sounds like kids in Wales could potentially be indoctrinated into gender ideology rather than being taught about biology and taught about scientific truth. So the crusade against biological sex, this crusade to erase men and women is intensifying and we really need a push back against uh, it. We really, really do. I really need, I mean, certainly the, the UK government to, to push back on this, the, sort of the wiping out of women women's existence, I do find uh, particularly uh, distressing. Um, let's uh, also talk about where we are in terms of uh, COVID. Um, we've got, now we're told, you know, 250 uh, people in hospital with Omicron. We don't know where they caught it, how old they are, whether they're being treated for it or not. Uh, we've got estimates of 200,000 infections a day uh, from the UK uh, Health Security Agency. Estimates, not no evidence of that. You know, computer models suggest it. Not entirely sure we trust computer models anymore. Um, we are now in a process that we, even with uh, 80 would appear rebels from the Tory side, we're going to see vaccine passports being brought in. Uh, Prime Minister having promised again and again, and many other ministers this would never happen. Um, we are back on the slippery slope, back to restrictions and lockdown, aren't we? What do you make of it all? I think it's absolutely terrifying, and I, I you know, it remains to be seen how how bad Omicron is. At, at the moment, it seems relatively mild in comparison to some earlier variants, but let's see. But the broader point is we can't go on like this. We can't keep shutting down society and suspending civil liberty and threatening people's livelihoods every time a new variant of this virus emerges. You know, we were told that once we were vaccinated, we would learn to live with the virus. Yeah. Now, 95% of people in Britain have some form of antibodies. Huge numbers have been vaxxed. We need to now live with this virus like we do with other viruses, which also make people ill and which also lead sometimes to hospitalization. That is part of life. And we've got to be adults about this and stop running away and believing that we can hide from COVID. Yeah. And that's, you know, we're destroying society in order to stave off a disease. And that's really, really bad. Indeed. I mean, again, the, the hysteria yesterday over one Omicron death. Again, we don't know whether this could have been someone who was in hospital for three weeks at death's door, who's 97 years old, who's caught it in hospital and has then sadly died. Very sad for their family. I'm not entirely sure it should have any bearing on public policy. But undoubtedly, that was that was all over the headlines yesterday. Uh, or massive a big issue for a lot of people. Oh, people are dying of this. But I think an awful lot of people don't understand that, that people die every day and they die of a lot of other things than COVID. And while, we're, while we've got an NHS service that's become the National COVID service, a lot more of those other people are going to die. That's the that's the point. And, you know, as you say, people die of something every single day, older people in particular who are frail and weak and, and near the end, you know, they will often be taken off by flu or something like that. That's been happening for centuries. And the idea that it should be front page news is just ridiculous. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, turning the National Health Service into the National COVID service is lethal and absurd and dangerous because we really could have a situation where people will avoid going to the doctors, avoid going to a hospital because they know the pressure is on in relation to COVID or so, or so we're told. And people could go with undiagnosed sicknesses, undiagnosed cancers. There could be a real explosion of health problems in the future yeah. because of this COVID myopia. Oh, yeah. We have to shake ourselves and, out. And of that's it. on top of the mental stress that people are under with the prospect of this happening again and again and again. I've been telling everyone for the last year and a half, if we do this again this year, we do it every year. There is yeah. going to be no, we'll, we'll have crossed that line. And once we do it again now, that's it for the rest of our lives. And if